Um, so first, this is the assignment for Tuesday, right? So I want you to read the second chapter in writing analytically. And if you get nothing else from it, just make sure that you pay really close attention to what's on pages 56 to 61, right? It's the part that starts with um, uncovering assumptions and ends with reformulating binaries, right? Um, <clears throat> this is kind of like the real meat of that chapter in terms of picking apart the underlying ideas in what you're reading. So that's what I really want you to focus on. You're also going to do assignment one at the end of chapter one. And these are the guidelines for it, right? So it's going to be 500 words long. In general, the homework assignments will be 500 words long unless I say otherwise. You're going to use a paragraph or an even smaller unit of text from the essay by Seneca on liberal and vocational studies and reading the world as your subject, right? So you're going to be taking a small part of that essay and picking that apart. I will be showing you how to do that over the course of today's session. You are also, because you're doing a reading and reading the world, you're also going to give me at least three words from Seneca that you had to look up with their definitions. Right? So every time you read something and reading the world, this is something you're going to do. Right? And again, like, like you, don't have to, um, you don't have to put the definitions in your own words. Right? You can even just tell me like, you know, what you looked up. And that's fine, right? I just, want to make, I just want to be encouraging people to actually look shit up when you don't know it. Right? One of the smartest, that, one of the surest signs of intelligence is to recognize the limits of your own knowledge. Yes, Gia? So we're doing the assignment one from writing analytically, and it's 500 words, and then we take, what do we do? What do we use a paragraph? Okay, so there's an essay in Reading the World uh, by Seneca called On Liberal and Vocational Studies. Right, it starts on page 11. So you are going to be taking um, a small chunk of text from that essay, right? Now, we'll explain over the course of today why you want to keep that chunk of text small. Right? In general, it's better to say more about a smaller piece of text than to say less about a bigger piece of text, right? Now, I still want you to read the whole essay so you understand the context. It's short. I mean, like it says 11 to 18. Uh, but, you know, the first page and a half is an introduction. And then there are, you know, guide questions at the end of the chapter. And actually, this is, a, this is another thing that I want you guys to be aware of, right? That each of these essays has a set of guide questions at the end, right? These understanding the text questions. If you look at those first and you try to answer them for yourself as you're doing the reading, you will understand what you're reading a lot better, right? You will already know kind of like what sorts of things are at stake and what to look for in the text if you look at these questions first and you try to answer them. So, you know, this would be one of those situations where it's not a bad idea to start at the end. Um, I also do want to show everybody that, you know, in the interest of helping you understand what you're reading. Um, I've put some resources up for you on the Georgia View site. So if you go to Georgia View and you go to the content browser, right, just click on the, the content tab on that toolbar once this damn thing activates. One constant running theme will, uh, with this class will be my, my impatience and struggles with technology. So if you click on the content tab, this is what you will see, right? And the sidebar here will show you um, a number of folders, each labeled with the title of an essay we're going to be reading. So if you click on Seneca, we have here right, a couple of podcasts from BBC Radio that help explain Seneca and that help explain what Stoicism, the philosophy he espoused, was. And also an article from the Times of London's Higher Education section defining what a liberal arts education is and what it's supposed to do. Right? 
So all of this is going to be background information that will help you understand the reading. And I've got stuff like this for each of the texts that you're going to be reading from right, reading the world. You don't have to use this stuff, but if you feel confused, this is stuff that might provide you with some helpful context. Okay, right. Uh, so does anybody have any questions about what's due for Tuesday? Everybody understands? So we're doing the do the method on a reading where we're looking for repetitions, strands, and binaries. Yep, that is exactly what you are doing. And does everybody, um, I'm sure you've all used Georgia View, View before, right? Everybody understands how to turn stuff in? Okay. So let me just show you what this is going to look like um, on your end. All right, you go to assignments. All right, there should only be. Well, there really should only be two things open here. I guess I got to fix uh, that thing on page 298. Um, yeah, um, <clears throat> anything that's anything that, that is linked in blue, right? You can submit to. So you can you can submit assignment one, and you can submit your vocabulary assignment, right? So that's, so that's all set to go. So the vocabulary will be like on a whole separate document. Yep, that'll be on a separate document. Yeah, well, and we'll just, so I'm just going to kind of keep those together and keep a running tally of um, what your grades are on those, right? So, you know, this will function a little bit differently than uh, grade-wise than a lot of the other items here, right? So, you know, you will accumulate points in it as you turn more of them in. So, you know, it might look like, you know, why did I only get one out of ten, right? So, well, it's because you got full credit for that one that you did, right? It's just easier than me setting up 10 separate assignment documents uh, for this particular assignment. Okay. I'll oh, so go ahead. Yep. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Then most days I'm going to want to start with a quick close reading exercise, at least for the first couple of weeks, just to get us used to doing this. So I'm going to put a quote up on the board, and I, I want you to try to pick this apart the way we did the Jonathan Swift passage from last time. So here is what we want to do with this, right? So first off, right, what is... the literal meaning of this. Second, we want to think about what the key words or concepts are, right? What are the most important words or ideas expressed in this quote? What ideas are related to each other in terms of either repetition or contrast. And finally, once we've picked all this out, we want to look for what is implied in the quote. So start with this first question and see what you can get, right? What does this thing, what does this mean literally, right? See if you can find some way to reword this and retain the original meaning.
So how many of you feel like you've answered this first question, like what the literal meaning is? Everybody feels like they've got something here? Okay, so what does this mean literally? How, how might we reword this and retain the original meaning? Um, yeah, go ahead, Kendall. Yeah. Powerful and stupid people both change their mindsets and other people's mindsets to believe they are correct instead of uh, looking at the truth. Okay, good. Anybody else? Okay. In particular, what kinds of people don't like to accept that they're wrong about something? Powerful, Powerful and stupid people, right? So what's unusual about the statement being made here? What's weird or interesting about this statement? Yeah, is that something we usually do? Well, yeah, these are two groups that we don't usually lump together, right? We don't usually think of powerful people or stupid people as being similar to each other, right? So we can already see that there's, yeah, there's something unusual going on here, right? And what's being done here, right, the, whoever wrote this quote is pointing out a kind of unexpected similarity between two things we think of as unlike, right? So what are the key words or concepts? Okay, powerful and stupid are the big ones, right? Powerful, stupid. What else is important here? Okay, views and facts. Yeah, alter it. The idea of change here is also important, right? It's central to the, to the idea of being communicated. All right, good. So far, so good. Okay, so let's think about which ideas are related to each other, either by similarity or by opposition. So we've already noted that stupid and powerful here are yoked together as similar, right? What other ideas seem to be related to each other, either by repetition and similarity or by contrast and opposition? Facts and views. Yeah, facts and views are here treated as opposites, right? What's the implied difference here between views and facts? Okay, yeah, um, that's what it's saying these groups do with them, right? But in terms of what the words themselves mean, right? What's the difference between a view and a fact? A view can, can, can be a fact, but a fact can't be a view. Yeah. A fact is what it is regardless of what you think of it, right? So a fact is something that is objectively true, right? Whereas a view is a matter of belief or opinion. So what does the statement seem to be imply? Does the statement seem to imply that this is a good thing or a bad thing? Okay, why do you think this thing that's implied that it's a bad thing? Why do you think it's implied that we should alter our views to fit the facts? Yeah, I think, you know, what, I, th I think that what it's saying here about powerful and stupid, right, is that people who are stupid can't see the world any other way, right? And it's implied that people who are powerful won't 
see the world in any other way, right? Then through the prism of their own views, their own opinions. So, what are the implied opposites of powerful and stupid? Powerful people who choose not to change their viewpoint. Um, well, yeah, 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 there's a matter of, the, yeah, the powerful can choose, right? There's, that's less an option when it comes to people who are simply intellectually incapable of doing so, right? But what I'm talking like, what, we don't have opposites for powerful and stupid clearly stated in the phrase, right? Mm -hmm. But what are the implied opposites of those concepts? What's the opposite of powerful? Or what might be the opposite of powerful? Yeah, weak or powerless, right? All right. Remember that just about every key term in anything you read is going to have an implied opposite, right? Even if it's left unstated. And then what might what might be the the opposite of stupid in this case? Yeah, smart, intelligent, right? So if the powerful and the stupid are alike in this way, then how are the weak and the intelligent alike? They see things as they are. Yeah, the weak because they have to, right? Because they don't have the power to change their circumstances. And intelligent because they know enough to <clears throat> infer correctly from facts, right? So a fact-based view of the universe here is attributed to people who are powerless and to people who are intelligent. Whereas denial of facts is attributed to people who are powerful and people who are stupid. Right? So the implication here is that both power and stupidity are dangerous things, right? Because they don't have to see the world as it is. Okay, so <clears throat> we've, what we've done here is a kind of basic demonstration of how what the book calls the method works on a small piece of text, right? So we've picked out a couple of strands of similarity here, like you know, places where similar con where concepts are related to each other. We've picked out a couple of uh, binary oppositions, right? These kinds of implied opposites, and we've pulled a meaning out of this that is beyond what is stated, right? So this is what you're going to be doing with text, by and large, over the course of the semester, and for the most part, over the course of your college careers, right? This is the reason why we tend to, we want you guys to take a class like this so early in your student careers, is so that you get used to doing this sort of thing, so you get used to dealing with difficult text in this way. So does anybody have any questions about what we just did or how this worked? Okay, so I want to try um, a little bit more practice in pulling out uh, implications from a statement. So I know not everybody, I see not everybody has the book yet. Um, so I'm just going to take things out of uh, page 25 here and writing analytically. I'm going to write them on the board for people who don't have the book. Um, and if you can't read my handwriting, which I realize is chicken scratch, uh, please tell me. My brain moves faster than my hands do, so sometimes uh, the words get a little garbled. Um, so what I want you to do is pick out what the unstated premises are in each of these statements, right? So let's start with the first one. The sidewalk is disappearing.
appearing as a feature damn it, of the American residential landscape. Simple observation, right? What are the implied premises here? The statement offers a fact, right? What does it not tell us? What question do we need to ask? Why is it disappearing? Yeah, why is it disappearing, right? What answer might we be able to provide here just from looking at this piece of information? Not many people are walking. Yeah, the sidewalk exists so that people can get from place to place on foot, right? Where do we tend to see sidewalks in cities? Like downtown. Yeah, usually like the downtown business core, right? or in the older parts of a town, right? You know, part, you know, the parts of town that were built before cars became a big deal, right? So like if you look around Americas, right? Um, there, are side, there, there are decent sidewalks in the historic districts, there are decent sidewalks downtown, but as soon as you leave that part of town, right, for newer construction, the sidewalks disappear. Um, you also find connected to that like in the historic district, very few of the houses have garages or carports. Um, if they do have them, then they're, they're not part of the original house, right? They're built later. So yeah, so the implication here is that people don't walk anywhere anymore. All right, because people drive everywhere. <clears throat> The people who design residential neighborhoods hoods don't include sidewalks. Okay, let's look at the second one. Here. New house designs, right, sticking with this architectural theme here, or city planning, or whatever you want to call it, are tending increasingly. toward open plans in which the kitchen is not separated from the rest of the house. So again, the question here we need to ask is why, right? So what is this implying about social change? Why does it matter? Why is it important that new houses are designed with these open kitchen plans and the kitchen's not separated from the rest of the house? Okay, yeah, it means that yeah, more people in the household tend to be involved in the housework, right? And if the kitchen is separate from the rest of the house, right, then what does that indicate about, uh, like, how, how, like, how does that place the person doing the cooking and the washing up in relation to the rest of the family? It them. Yeah, it isolates them, right? So this suggests, you know, that as family units do more of their own housework, right? Cooking used to be done, you know, amongst people who had the means to, to own their own homes, typically by a servant, right? Um, <clears throat> as work is spread more equitably across the family, then the person doing 
the main cooking and cleaning in the kitchen is not to be isolated from the rest of the family, right? Can participate in family activities. Okay, so example three here is taken um, directly from uh, one of the classics of American literature. Mending Wall by Robert Frost. Good fences make good neighbors. What does this mean? Why do good, good fences make good neighbors? What does this suggest the person who wrote this statement values in a neighbor? Privacy. Privacy, right? A good neighbor minds his or her own damn business, right? And a fence provides privacy. So this seems to run directly counter to statement two here, right? You know, where the open kitchen plan provides greater opportunities for sociability, right? <clears throat> here, the poet Robert Frost is saying that actually less sociability between neighbors, right, is what keeps that relationship cordial. Right. Clear demarcations of where my property ends and yours begins. So there might also be some implications here about the value of private property, right? That neighbors not only respect each other's privacy, they respect each other's property. Right, a very typically American social value. Okay, um, let's skip over some of the longer ones here um, and just, we'll just finish up with number six. Shopping malls and grocery stores rarely have clocks. We could also add that the classrooms in this building do not have clocks. But so let's start by asking which things in the statement here are alike. Yep, shopping malls and grocery stores are yoked together here, right? And how are these things alike? You go there to buy stuff. Yes, commerce, capitalism, right? These are places where you go to buy stuff. And what does a clock do for us? It tells the time. Yeah, a clock tells time, right? So if there is no clock in a particular location, why does that matter? Because you don't know how much time you're wasting. Yeah, you don't know what time it is, right? You don't know how much time you're spending in this place. And if they don't have a clock in a place where they want you to buy stuff, what are they trying to encourage you to do? Buy more stuff because you don't know how much time you've been in there. Yeah, hang around longer and buy more crap, right? So yeah, this notion of you know time being related to money, right? You know, everybody's heard the cliche "time is money," right? Mm -hmm. But in this case, they want you to spend more time because then you will spend more money, right? That collapsing your sense of time will encourage you to shell out the bucks. So. <clears throat> These are all single sentence examples, right? You are going to be doing this kind of work with short paragraphs. Um, and I'll explain in a moment how we're going to do that. Um, but first, I do want to make a couple of quick points about, um, I just want to shift gears for a minute and make a couple of quick points about reading and writing. I want you guys to think about something for a minute, right? 
how many of you think that you are good writers? And don't raise your hand and answer. I want you to just take a couple of minutes and write out why you think you are, you are a good writer or why you think you are not a good writer, and to be willing to share this with the rest of the class. And I'm going to put one rule up on the board here, right? No false modesty. If you think you're good, say you're good. Take one more minute, wrap up your thoughts. Okay, so who is willing to start? I would prefer a volunteer, but I'm not above just calling on people. Kendall, go ahead. I said, I don't think I'm a good writer because I know I have good ideas. I just don't know how to present them properly. Okay, thank you. Who's next? Yeah, Eric. I said, I don't believe I'm a strong writer. This is due to the fact that I struggle to stay on topic, and I tend to go in rabbit holes when I'm writing an essay. Okay. Go ahead, Ronald. Uh, I said I'm not a good writer because, like, I get off the subject, like, start writing the BS. Okay. Like, like the BS. Yep. Oh, I, 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 yep. I, I know the BS very well. <laughs> okay, Gia. Um, I feel like I'm a decent writer, not good nor bad. Uh huh. Um, I I can also be yes. Like I was 
like if, especially if I'm like writing about something that I'm not like strong, like I don't strongly know enough about. Okay. I start like rewording what I've already said. Okay. But like if it's mm -hmm. something that like I know what I'm writing about, like I get passionate about it and like I can do it. Uh huh. And you know I have a pretty good vocab. So. Okay. Elizabeth. Um, I said that I was an okay writer. I wasn't the best, but not the worst. Uh huh. Cause like even through high school, I if I found like a topic that I like loved, I would be done in a day. Right. But, like there's a topic that I didn't like or I didn't know much about, I would uh -huh. need, I would need like a whole week. Yeah, and I think this is one of the things that's hard to do. Like I'm noticing, like most of you are defining your writing in terms of deficits, right? Even those of you who say that you are decent writers are talking mostly about the things you think you're not good at, right? Um, and yeah, it is often harder to write about things that you don't find intrinsically interesting. It's harder to do uh, work on that sort of thing. Um, this is something I know, you know, from experience myself, right? Um, but one thing that I want everybody to take away from this class, right, is that good writers are made, not born. We often come into our education with this notion that there are some things that we're good at and there are some things that we're not good at and that we can never learn to be good at the things that we're just already not good at, right? Um, for years, uh, I just told myself that I was bad at math and that I couldn't do math, right? I just can't, I, I just can't grasp geometry or calculus, right? And it wasn't that I couldn't do it. It was that I didn't find it all that interesting. So I didn't try very hard, right? I just decided, well, you know, this, this, is, this is hard and it's boring. So I'm just not going to bother to learn it. And I internalized that negative attitude and described it in terms of a deficit of, my, you know, a deficit of intelligence on my part, right? So the point I'm trying to make here is that like, your brain is like a muscle. And the more you use it and the more you work it, the stronger it's going to get. The more you practice writing with feedback, the better you're going to get at it. This is one of the reasons why there are so many damn assignments in this class, right? You're going to write a lot. But by the end of the course, you are going to be a better writer for the experience. Now, the other thing that I want you to try to do here today before we continue, I want you to try to kind of change your frame of reference here slightly, right? Don't think about whether you are a good or a bad writer. Take another three or four minutes and just make a list of the things that you think you do well in your writing. What are you already good at as a writer? Right? What are your strengths? As a writer whether you think you're a good writer or not, on the whole.
take your time. Not everybody writes the same pace, and that's fine, right? Being a slow and careful writer is often a good thing. Okay, so it looks like it pretty much everybody stopped writing. Who is willing to go first? Um, All right, Gia, yeah, go ahead. Um, my wording is pretty good. Okay. Uh, vocab, sentence structure for the most part. Mm -hmm. And I'm really good at MLA format. Okay. Okay, good. It's good to have somebody who's good at MLA formats. Yeah. It reduces the amount of work I have to do. All right. Um, who wants to go next? Yeah, Elizabeth. I said I think I'm good at like telling my facts, but not my opinions. Okay. Like in an argument essay. Okay, yeah, being objective is a really good thing. Yeah. 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 Ye
you know, it's fine in your day-to-day, -day, your day-to-day -day life, right? It's, you know, fine in your ordinary conversations with your grandma or with your best friend or whatever, right? But if you're actually trying to dig in and understand something, um, your attitude towards it can either um, blind you to its defects or can turn you off to it so much that you just don't want to bother studying it, right? So what you want to do when you are working on something is try to suspend judgment for as long as possible. Try not to think about whether you like it or dislike it. Instead, even in something you dislike, try to find something that is interesting or weird. Right, so, um, you know, for example, uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, you know, my wife got us a subscription to HBO Max so that we could watch the new Wonder Woman movie. Because we liked the first one. Um, we didn't like the second one. Um, well, I thought the pacing was really poor. Um, I thought that the, uh, one of the two villains was really, of course, the woman villain was really kind of underdrawn and underused. Um, and a, it seemed kind of like an opportunity to make a bunch of uh, stupid 80s jokes, right? Mm -hmm. That there was no particular reason to set the movie in 1984 except to give everybody square haircuts and these kind of like weird angular bodies, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, but, you know, when I thought about it, you know, one, I actually found the setting in that particular year, 1984, you know, peak 80s, as interesting because the 80s really kind of are the American era of runaway greed and capitalism. And what the main villain is trying to do is promise everybody everything they want, right? Everything you want is viable, is achievable. Just give me your faith and your money, right? And you can have it. So it's setting this actually pretty contemporary problem of kind of like, um, allaying our grievances with the purchase of stuff in the era when that really took off in American culture. And thus kind of like, you know, making a point about today by talking about the past. So even though I didn't particularly like the movie, right, I can still find this interesting feature in it to analyze. And this is what I want you to try to do with most of what you read, right? You're not gonna like a lot of the things I give you to read. I, I, I guarantee that. But just the fact that you don't like it or that you don't find it entertaining doesn't mean that you won't find things that are interesting in it or things that are valuable. So what you want to try to do is cultivate what the poet John Keats called negative capability. To paraphrase what Keats meant by this, negative capability is comfort with uncertainty. Right, it's okay to not have an answer for something right away. In fact, if you feel like you have an answer for something right away, what are the odds that it's a good answer? Yeah, you're probably just jumping to conclusions based on gut reactions, right? Mm -hmm. So in particular, when you're still in the observation and fact gathering stage of writing, refrain from judgment, right? Refrain from jumping to an idea. Gather your data first, and then think about what it means. Because if you look at a text or a set of data and you expect to see a pattern, right? 
you're going to see that pattern whether it's there or whether it's the most interesting pattern or the most meaningful pattern or not, right? So try to come to whatever you're reading without preconceived notions. And just let the facts speak for themselves. Then try to make a claim about them, right? That should come after. Now, <clears throat> the second part of your um, data gathering phase should be to break your subject down into parts. Right? Ask yourself what are the most important details give you something to read. You pull a bunch of details that look important or interesting out of it. The next step is then to try to rank them in terms of things that seem, that seem to, to you most important or most interesting to least important or least interesting, right? And the things you should be focusing your attention on then further are those things at the top of your list, right? Now, once you've got these details and ranked them in order of importance, right, you're going to drop the stuff that doesn't seem all that important. That's just what it knows, at least for your purposes. Then what you're going to want to do is determine relationships between details. Focus first on direct repetitions, right? Words or phrases that keep popping up again and again and again, right? Now, when we talk about repetition, right, remember that we're talking about meaningful repetition. If and or the or but keep recurring, right, is that necessarily important? No, like these little linking words don't matter that much, right? So make sure that you're focusing on repetitions of keywords, like meaning bearing words. The next thing you're going to want to look for are what we call strands. And strands are patterns of similarity. So these are direct repetitions, but these are words that are clearly supposed to be related to each other in some way, right? So if you see a list of words in a text, I mean, they won't obviously be listed right next to each other, but if you're going through a text and you see words like stove, mixer, spatula, dishwasher, sink, cupboard, what do all of these words have in common? Kitchen yeah, these are all things you find in the kitchen, right? So when you're looking for a strand, right, remember that you're looking for words that are kind of linked thematically, right? Rather than by direct repetition. The next thing you're going to want to look for are what we call binaries. And binaries are opposites or contrasts. All 
right? Things that we often, um, you know, we actually engage in binary thinking pretty much all the time, right? There are a lot of things that we tend to define in terms of their opposite, right? So for example, what is cold? Okay, well yeah, what is the opposite of cold, right? Hot or warm, right? Yeah, so cold, we tend to think of as the absence of heat, right? So there are a lot of but you know there are a lot of these kinds of pairs that um, you know one of them is the negative of the other, right? So you know think about things like hot cold. Give me a couple other examples. Fire Okay, fire water. Yep. Light and dark. Light and dark. Good. Open closed. Keep going, you're doing great. Boy, girl. Okay, yeah. Boy, girl, male, female, right? Yeah. So, <clears throat> when we look for binaries, right, like oftentimes the arguments in the text that we're going to be reading or the key themes in the text that we're going to be reading are organized in terms of some pair of opposites. So what you're going to want to try to think about is which contrasts are important, right? Which ones are central to the argument being made or to the theme being elaborated? And um, <clears throat> sometimes the contrast is going to be implied, right? So for example, the quote that we looked at at the beginning of class. There is an implied contrast there between powerful and powerless and intelligent and stupid, right? But in both of those cases, half of the binary is left unstated. So that is a question you are always going to want to ask yourself when you find, you know, repetitions or strands, right? You're going to want to ask, is this half... of an unstated, like, is this half of an implied binary? And if so, what's the unstated term of the binary? So if, for example, you're reading a short story in which the protagonist is obsessed with keeping warm, right? It may not ever mention the word cold, but it's implied that that's the force that the protagonist is struggling against, right? Mm -hmm. Even if it never says anything about cold, the fact that you know the hero is you know bundling up in furs and building a fire and rubbing his hands together to keep warm, right? Cold is clearly the important force against which he's struggling. Does this make sense? Yes. Everybody got me? Okay. Now, <clears throat> the last thing that you're going to want to do when you're starting an analysis of any particular subject is take all of this work you've done and think about what this all adds up to. Right, in the end, right, what does this mean? Why does it matter that there's this implied struggle between hot and cold, right? Why does it matter that there is this strand um, of kitchen objects and kitchen utensils um, in a story that's not about cooking, right? Why does it matter that these important ideas are clearly in here but are left unstated? 
And what you're going to want to do is just keep asking yourself, right, so what, why does this matter, until you come up with a claim that covers all of it, right? We'll work on how to do that a little later. But for now, what I want us to focus on is this picking apart work, right? We're going to start with the picking apart. And as we proceed over the next couple of sessions, we're going to work on putting it together into a thesis statement, right? OK, so does anybody have any questions about anything that we've discussed today? So for like our homework, mm -hmm. we take, do we type like the paragraph that we've chosen on the page, like all this important stuff, but we type it on, um, the, on like the paragraph we're using? I would say, you know, just, um, Give me like the first sentence and the last sentence in the paragraph so I can find it. But you don't have to type the whole thing out. Would that count as towards our 500? It does not. <laughs> Which is why I'm telling you not to type the whole thing out, right? It doesn't count towards your 500 anyway. Yeah, so no, it's just finding like. So when we're typing like mm -hmm. our analysis of it, yeah. and we're like typing like the strands and binaries, how would we like. We just. Put, try to put, put it in a sentence, like put words. Yeah, I would say, like, first, like, like, do scratch work for yourself, right? Just, you know, take a piece of notebook paper and write out the strands, binaries, whatnot that you notice, right? And then try to focus on the ones that you think are most important or most interesting, right? Particularly if it seems like they have something in common with each other. And write about that, right? Like what it all adds up to when Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so yeah, try to focus on that and provide evidence that this is what this means or this is what this adds up to, right? Okay, any other questions about anything at all? Okay, so I'm going to let you go a little bit early today um, because we covered everything we want to cover. Um, and I mean, you know, it's only 10 minutes to go into class anyway. So um, enjoy your weekend. Um, <laughs> please do feel free to contact me if you have questions about the assignment while you're working. And I do want everybody to know that I'm also happy to look over your assignment for you before you turn it in if you want me to. But if you want me to do that, then make sure that I get it at least 24 hours before it's due. Yeah, yeah. If you get me something by Monday, then I will I will look it over for you, because that gives you t that gives me time to look it over, and it gives you time to actually implement changes. Right. Cool. Oh yeah, you can just leave that up here. Um. So right, let's get ourselves cleaned up and get you on your way. And just remember, green is clean, brown is sold. Sanitizing spray to smell better. Have a good weekend. You too. I'm still going to have to do the